All right, we're in our final section here. We're in chapter 4, The Courage to Preach Scripture. We've made it through verses 1 through 5, uh, Paul's uh, commission to Timothy to preach, uh, to be faithful despite opposition. And now he's going to call him in verses 6 through 8 uh, to perseverance, to finish the race. So he, he told him there in verse 5, as for you, be sober-minded always, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And now in verse 6, Paul is going to point to himself uh, as the sort of example of how to emulate. This is, this is the way that it should look, Timothy, verse 6, for I have already, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. So, Paul is not only teaching Timothy, he's also been modeling for Timothy what it means to finish well. He's told him to finish well, but then he has done his best by the grace of God to finish well himself. It says he is, he's already being poured out as a drink offering. Now, a drink offering in the Old Testament, you had your, your normal offerings that you were required to do, but there was an over and above offering that you could do. It's called a drink offering. So you'd, you'd have your offering up there being consumed, and what you could do is you could, you could pour one out for the Lord, uh, as it were, and you would, you would pour some sort of, you know, it would be wine or some sort of, yeah, uh, enriching drink, um, and it would be an, an over and above sort of thankfulness kind of picture to the Lord. Um, Paul says, that's me right now. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. He has lived in such a way where he is, he is filled with thankfulness and he is trying by all the grace that God gives to over and above lay down his life. And he is, he's poured out for, for the Lord. He is filled with thankfulness overflowing in his service. He says, the time of my departure has come. Paul sees his expiration date in this world as having, having arrived. He looks at his life and he, he finds a sense of holy satisfaction. You, you could be tempted to read this and see this as prideful. This is not pride. This is a sober-minded man who looks at his life and has a clear conscience that he's done the best that he could do by the grace of God and all of the areas that he's failed, he's He's confessed those things. He's laid them before the Lord. All of his, his, his good deeds he knows have been done by the grace of God. All of his, you know, weak deeds have been covered by God's grace. He is, he's ready to go be with the Lord. He's, he's done his, his work. And he's, there's a sense of satisfaction. He says in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith seems to be drawing upon the imagery. Remember back in chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, of the soldier and the athlete and the farmer. He says, I've, I've kept the commands of my commander. I have run according to the rules. I have planted, and seed, uh, planted seed and watered it, and God has given growth. He, he looks at it, and he says, now, suffering now, glory later, and glory is fast approaching for him in a way that he is... He's satisfied. He says, verse 8, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. In the games that would uh, happen in Rome in the Colosseum, a winner would get a laurel wreath, kind of a, a very a perishable wreath that would be placed on your head. He sees himself as about to get another sort of, of crown, one that will not perish. It's an everlasting one. It's the one that James speaks of in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So I think the crown of life and the crown of righteousness, I think it's, I think it's the same thing. This is the Lord rewarding, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You will now reign with him forever and ever. 
Those who persevere with him will reign with him. All of those, that imagery is coming to, to fruition here, and he's envisioning that soon he's going to hear that commendation from the Lord. And you notice here, who gets the reward? In that James passage, God has promised that to those who love him, and that same sentiment is echoed here by Paul. Those who love him, all who have loved his appearing... Paul says the believer is to above all things love the appearing, to want that day when the Lord Jesus comes, that's their chief delight. I don't know how much you think about the return of Christ, but the, through the New Testament, it is the prominent focus of all of the New Testament authors. It is the prominent promise in the book of Revelation. Like it is, it is to be the orienting reality for the Christian is that Jesus is coming soon and soon we get him. We see him. We get to be with him in his presence. He's coming. In our family, or in our church family, we have we often have people who deploy to go serve our country overseas, and, and you can you just see there's the family who's behind. They're always eagerly awaiting the day when their loved one's going to come home. They're, they're ready for them to come. They're, everything is about that day. All the more for the Christian. And this is where Satan wants to do all he can to just make us forget that and not be sober-minded. Some of us can go hours, days, weeks, months, years, never even thinking about the return of Jesus. That's not good for us. The return of Christ and His appearing should be on the forefront of all of our minds. Plead with God to help you to do that. There have been seasons of life where I've had a very helpful practice for me as when I roll out of bed first thing to do is to take a knee and to say, Lord, would you send, would you, Father, would you send the Son today and help everything I do be oriented around the reality that He might come? Give me urgency and sobriety today in sin and in evangelism and in all things. Help me to relate to temptation as if Christ could come at any moment and evangelism as if Christ could come at any moment and opportunities as not being interruptions but as seeing, look, the, the Lord could come at any moment. That sort of practice is helpful, it's normal for the Christian, and Paul says, that's where my heart is. Loving that appearing and seeing Him, and not just because I'm done with this life, but like you want Him, it has a transforming effect on the believer. Paul says, persevere, Timothy, I have finished the race. I'm about to see Him. Do you notice again how just the end is forefront for him? I mean, it's mentioned multiple times here. I've finished the race. The prize is coming. Um, love is appearing. It's, it's forefront again for Paul, and he's helping Timothy to have that heavenly mindedness. Now, in verses 9 through 18, he is going to say that Jesus stood by me. So, as Paul concludes this letter to Timothy, he's, he's freshly reminded that everything in this life fades and that all he has is Christ. Verse 9, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me for ministry. Tychius I have sent to uh, Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, as the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he is strongly opposed to our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. 
the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul works through this list of relationships. And he begins first with Timothy, the one that he's writing the letter to. And he says, come, do your best to come to me soon. So Timothy has been charged to do the work, but at the top of the list is to come and pay me a visit. There's an urgency here that Paul lays on Timothy's heart. Yes, be about the ministry, but the first ministry I'm asking you to do is to me. Come be with me. My days are short. I'm about to die. Come. Because not everybody's standing by me, verse 10. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. If you're familiar with the New Testament, you've heard this name Demas before. He showed up both in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, and Philemon, verse 24. In those references, he was a faithful minister of the gospel who was known among the churches as being such. He labored alongside Paul. He preached. He proclaimed the word. He was, he was, he was about it. But now he's been about something else. He has, he's quit. He is in love with this present world. Rather than loving the appearing of Jesus, he has loved the fleeting pleasures of sin. What a stark contrast between Demas and Paul, right? You have Paul, who's, who's about to be executed by the world because he doesn't love the world, because rather he loves the Lord and the world to come. And you've got Demas, who forsakes the world to come because he's in love with this world. Such a sad, silly picture. I mean, he just, he esaw it. He just, he esawed the whole thing. He traded his inheritance for a bowl of soup. Now, it's easy for us to be armchair quarterbacks on this and be like, what a fool, but, but this, is, this is real. The, the pressures, this is why Paul's been telling Timothy and warning him, that pressure, the world is, it's real. It's, it's like a magnet. It's strong. You can watch it. Doing ministry here in the Washington, D.C. area to watch just the, the allure of power, what it does to people, it's a strange thing. I've had multiple friends move to New York chasing the dream and to watch the way it, I'm not saying you can't be a Christian in New York, but the, the, the pull of the world just to watch it have sucked the life out of, of several people that I know is just, it's incredibly terrifying. The world is strong and you've got to be careful to, to be in the world but not of it, to know what you're about. Because it, it has pleasures, but they are fleeting. And he's deserted. Demas has deserted Paul, and he's gone to Thessalonica. He's gone back to the, to the party scene in whatever way that was. Verse 10, Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. It's modern-day Yugoslavia. These, these brothers departed, but not for, for wickedness. Rather, they're carrying on the mission, but they're just not with Paul anymore, is, is the idea. Verse 11, Luke alone is with me. This is Luke, the author of both the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts. He was uh, Paul's traveling companion, which was a good deal for Paul. He needed a doctor around because he got beat up so much. He's always, it's kind of good for him to have the doctor with him. He's like, Luke, you can't, you can't leave me. I'm, this is, I mean, he, he's constantly needing medical assistance, <laughs> um, which is sad, but, but it's true. He um, Luke remained with him. And it's in these days that Luke is, you know, I mean, he's, he's there with him recording, um, and he's going to, to use much of the, te the teaching, the instruction of Paul in his own writings and ministry. 
Verse 11, what a sweet verse. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me in ministry. If you've been with us during our series in Acts, you'll know what he's talking about here. This was the scene in Acts chapter 15 where Paul and Barnabas disagreed over whether they should take John Mark with them on the next uh, round of the ministry trip. So that before the second missionary journey, um, they had a sharp disagreement, it says, between Paul and Barnabas. And it was over John Mark because John Mark had previously um, left them on the mission field. They'd been in the midst of the heat of the battle. We don't know exactly why he left, but he went home, got homesick for some reason, left them. It's time to roll out for the next missionary journey, and Barnabas is like, oh, let's grab John Mark, who is his cousin, and Paul's like, no, we we can't take him, and that whole, we did a whole message on on this, and fast forward now to the end of, of Paul's life, and we hear this sweet word, bring Mark. He's very useful for me for ministry. There's been restoration. There's been reconciliation. God has done work in Mark. God has done work in Paul. And these brothers are able to, um, yeah, to be ministering together again. What a, lots of sweet application there of hopefulness in the midst of some, some, some sorrowful stories here as well. Verse 12, Tychius, I have sent to Ephesus. We've heard of this brother before in Acts chapter uh, 20, verse 4. He's a faithful traveling companion of Paul. He shows up um, in uh, Ephesians 6. Uh, 21 through 22, and Colossians 4, 7 through 9, in those sections he's called a, a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of the Lord. Um, and, and it's interesting here, Tychius I have sent to Ephesus. Now, he may have been who, the one who's actually brought in the letter, or it may be that, that Paul is telling Timothy, hey, he's gone to Ephesus so you can feel free to leave and come to see me. Um, it's covered. There's, there's a shepherd to watch the flock while you're gone and coming to minister to me. So when you come, verse 13, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Uh, or, we don't know about leaving behind the cloak. Uh, maybe he just left it at his house, or maybe he was cold and he left it. We don't know why, but he left the cloak with him. Uh, but notice here, he's cold in prison. Uh, winter is approaching. He's got no provisions. And he says, bring my coat. Also, the books and above all, the parchments. He's calling for Timothy to bring the books, his writing materials, and above all, his copies of the scriptures. Notice here at the end of Paul's life, what he wants around him is he wants to be surrounded by God's people, he wants to be sustained by God's word, and he wants God's mission to carry on. This is what's on his mind at the end of his life which is sweet because the world he's about to enter into is the land where the work is completed. He's surrounded by God's people forevermore, and God's Word, the living Word, is now known by sight and not by faith. But until that's the case, he surrounds himself with Word, people, and, and, and this, this comfort that they bring. Verse 14, but not everybody's a friend here. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. Verse 15, beware of him yourself, for he is strongly opposed to our message. We don't know if this Alexander is the same Alexander uh, in Acts chapter 19 or the one uh, mentioned in 1 uh, Timothy chapter um, 1 verse 20. It's a common name of the day. We don't know, but what we do know is that Timothy needs to be aware of him. Paul had been afflicted by this man Alexander. We don't know what he's done to him, but whatever it was, it was cruel, and it left a mark on Paul's memory. But Paul was not afraid of him. He tells Timothy to, 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 be, to be aware, but, but he's not afraid of him. Verse 14, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. We mentioned this maybe last night, but one of the things that gave Paul confidence in serving the Lord with reckless abandon meant, is the same thing that should help us. It's twofold. We can serve the Lord to the point of death because we know two things. One, the resurrection, and two, retribution. One, resurrection. You can serve the Lord to the point of losing your life, and you don't lose because the Lord will raise you up from the dead. Death is not the end for the believer. It is a comma, not a period. 
Right? He, will, he is going to raise you up. You will, grave will not win. Sin will not win. He will raise you up. Which, by the way, that's one of the reasons the Lord says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you've got to die to follow Jesus. Because if you're already dead, then you're free. You're like, what are you going to do? Kill me? I'm already dead. <laughs> I'm his, right? So resurrection is on his mind and also retribution. Paul does not feel the need. He doesn't like V for vendetta. Like he does not feel the need to just come back and blast everybody. He does not feel the need to tell Timothy, hey, here's a list of people we need to do some business on. You know, settle some scores for me. Like he doesn't do that. He's like, the Lord has a list. The Lord knows. The Lord knows who's done what. This should be a comfort to you to not be debilitated in your days of ministry by people who have harmed you. As far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. But never repay evil. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's Romans chapter 12. Your job is to be faithful. You preach the word. You live it out. You help others follow Jesus. And for people who do harm to you, you let the Lord take care of it. When the Lord says vengeance is mine, it means it's above your pay grade to bring justice. Everybody's about, we want to be about justice. And there's a form of justice that we can know and should pursue in this life, but there's very much another sort of justice that we just can't. The Lord will make all wrongs right. He sees all things, knows all things. That can give you comfort to not be controlled by the need to try and put somebody else in their place or do whatever it may be. The Lord will take care of it. Again, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be appropriate bits of justice in ways that we can bring it in this life, but ultimate justice the Lord will bring. Verse 16, in my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. He's not speaking about his first imprisonment here, but rather his present trial, right? The the present trial that he's in, that's common at your first hearing to have advocates to come and speak for the accused. But as that happened, nobody stood by Paul. Um, Just as the Lord Jesus was abandoned in his time of need, everybody deserted him, Paul had that same experience. Um, Now, the the brother in chapter 1, Onesim, who is it? Where is he? Onesiphorus. I keep saying Onesimus. I knew it wasn't him. Onesiphorus, that brother likely came after the first, um, first portion of the trial had completed. Um, it seems like that's probably what's happened. But, but Paul here is experiencing what happened to Christ. And do you notice, how does Paul respond? What does he say there in verse 16? May it not be charged against them. So notice Paul wasn't embittered against them, but he pleaded for mercy for them. Who does that sound like? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's it's like Paul is following the footsteps of Jesus, because he is, in, in every real sense. He's being persecuted. He's being falsely charged. He's being held not for any kind of sin. And as he's there... He's bringing as many people with him as he can, just like the Lord Jesus did. And he's not, he's pleading for mercy for people around him, even though everybody's abandoned him. He is, he's following Jesus. In verse 17, even though he was left alone by his friends, he was not abandoned by the Lord. The Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. I think what he means here is God was near to him in his time of need. He knew the Lord hadn't forsaken him, even though he's facing the lion. Now, this could be metaphorical or it could be literal. Again, the situation here, um, in, in July of 64 AD, Nero had set Rome on fire. He was the Caesar at the time. He had set the, the emperor at the time, set the set the. Uh, the city on fire, and he had blamed the Christians, and Christians were being captured and tortured and put to death as kind of the scapegoat, and that is popping at this time. So, 
whether Paul's trial here is 64, when I think it probably is, like this is the winner of that time, so it's, it's hard. Some think it's 67, there's disagreement there, but it's during that time when it's, it, the persecution is hot for Christians. And one of the things that would happen to Christians is that part of the capital punishment was they would be put into the Colosseum um, and they would be wrapped, uh, they would be stripped naked, they would be wrapped in uh, skins of animals that were freshly slain, and then lions or dogs or other ravenous beasts that had been near starved were released, and they would be mauled to death as sport. Um, that didn't happen to Paul after the first hearing. So whether he was delivered from the mouth of the lion, Nero, metaphorically, or literally the mouth of the lion at the hands of Nero, either way, um, he sees himself as being stayed because he's getting more opportunity to proclaim more gospel to more people. So he would have testified, certainly, as he did every other time when we see him in Acts. At his trial, he would have testified of Christ, um, which likely means Nero heard the gospel clearly, um, and others uh, in his cabinet. So don't be surprised if in glory... You see some of Nero's cabinet uh, who uh, showed up, got converted. Uh, I think we'll be surprised when we get the glory, all the people the Lord used in the midst of all of this. There'll be jailers, there'll be people who are in prison there who likely, um, yeah, heard the gospel and believed. So Paul, Paul's not just embittered about his circumstance, but he's enlivened because Jesus is with him. And all he has is Christ, and all he needs is Christ, and all he wants is Christ. Verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Notice here, living is not the most important thing to Paul. As long as the Lord gives life, he wants to be faithful in it. But his aim is another land, right? He has great confidence that the Lord is going to be faithful, who was faithful to stand by him in the past, is going to be faithful to care for him in the future, which, by the way, is a really helpful way to fuel your faith as you look back at the past to see all the faithfulness of God and you remember it and you look forward to his promises and you know he's going to keep it and that holds you in the present. God's faithfulness in the past gives you confidence in the present to trust him for the future. Paul would not be delivered from death, but he would be delivered through death. And he just doesn't have fear. Not because he's crazy, but because he's confident. He's confident. He has confidence in the Lord. He's the same one that the, the Spirit led to write these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is to the right hand, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or Caesar? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He believed those things. And he was holding fast to that treasure as he faced his death, knowing that soon and very soon he would be with the Lord safely. He will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. You're not promised safety in this life, but you are promised that the Lord will safely bring you into the kingdom where harm can never touch you again. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he concludes with this final plea. He always wants to give more shout-outs. <laughs> plea, come before winter, verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila, 
in the household of Onesiphorus, same brother from back in 116. Priscilla and Aquila here, by the way, are um, they're the ones who taught Apollos in Ephesus. They show up in Acts multiple times, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, here in 2 Timothy. They are kind of a model of a faithful couple who wherever they are, they're always blessing folk. Um, a wonderful study on them and how God uses them, but um, as he's dying, he's thinking about the faithful couple who's, who's going to carry on the work. Greet them. Erastus remained at, at Corinth. He's a brother who traveled with Timothy in, in Acts 19, so he would have been like your buddy. He's, that's where he is. He's in Corinth. Um, I left Trophimus, the Ephesian, so he was an Ephesian as well. Um, we see him in Acts 21-29. Uh, well, he's become ill. I've left him at Miletus. So Trophimus had evidently grown gravely ill, and Paul had to leave him behind. Which I think is just an interesting note. However the gift of healing works, it's not just something that you can just heal anybody at the whim, or he certainly would have healed this man. Um, it appears to be in some sort of different capacity. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that works, but keep, in, keep that in mind. Verse 21 do your best to come before winter. So this is likely in the fall, um, probably because he wants his coat because it's going to be cold, but he also because he knows he's going to die soon. Maybe there's a date that's set for him. There's other greetings here. Um, and then he says, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. That's really interesting. Um, Chadwick, are you still following along in the Greek interlinear? The last word, can you notice anything about that? You? You notice anything interesting? Who said it? It's plural. It's plural. So, grace be with you. Notice this is written to Timothy, but it's not just to Timothy. It's to, it's, this is expected to be read to the whole church. So this letter, which is directed at Timothy, it's not just for Timothy. It's for the congregation. In the same way that this is not just something that we're going to read for people who, for the elders. This is not just a book for the elders. This was an edifying read for us all because it helps to orient us all because we're all in the same sort of mission. We are all being called by the grace of God to endure suffering for Christ, to do it with an eternal perspective, loving His appearing, doing it according to God's inspired, inerrant, all-sufficient Word, despite the fact that the persecution and suffering and detractors and defactors, they're going to come at all angles. There's always going to be hardship, but keep your eyes on Him because soon and very soon your day will come to depart from this world, to go to the next, and there give an account for our lives. So Timothy, Garrett, Delray Baptist Church, others who are listening, fight the good fight. Finish the race. Christ Jesus is the prize. He is worth it. He will be with you. We're almost home. Let me pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for 2 Timothy. We thank You for the depth and the breadth of this, this book which shows us the glories of Christ through a suffering man who trusted You. We know He was no perfect man, but certainly one to emulate, and we pray that You would help us to do so, that we would hear these words and receive these words and believe these words, and that You would use them to sober us and to give us grace in the days ahead. Hasten the day when faith will be sight. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we do the doxology one final time, are there any concluding questions, comments, insights from the book of First or Second Timothy here? I'd be helped by any particular ways that you'll take this away from the book as a whole. Um, yeah, we'll take a few minutes for that and then we'll be dismissed. Anybody have any? Dennis. Who else knows they have a question, comment, or something? They'd like to I'd see another hand, a couple more. Okay, yep. My name's Dennis. Um, in light of, in the spirit of, of, of Paul really um, telling Timothy, be aware of, of, of who you listen to and, 
and, and obviously that exhortation to us even today uh, with, with everything going on and you alluded to some that you've known personally and obviously others that have fallen away from faith but you know in a time they may have some good writings but how, how what are some practical ways that we um, as a church uh, might uh, stay away from some of those how, how do we guard ourselves from maybe entering into some of these somewhat deceptive writings or teachings? Yep. I'd say three things. Um, the first that I would think of is just read the Word regularly and deeply and delight in it. The way that, you know, um, the U.S. Treasury Department, that people who are in the counterfeit department are trained to be able to spot counterfeits is not by studying all the counterfeits, but it's by studying the real thing. So you, you study the bill and what it looks like, and you know it so that when there's an imposter, you're like, something doesn't feel right, doesn't, something doesn't look right, something is off. So you know the Word. Secondly, you read and study in community. So I would encourage you if there's a... I rarely read a book by myself. What I mean by that is I'm like, hey, I'm going to read through this book. Anybody want to read through it with me? And have people kind of jump in and we talk about it. Sometimes that will add a level of accountability and be like, yo, chapter three, they were tripping. Like, what is that about? Um, and if you were like, oh, actually, I really like chapter three. Let's talk about that. Then you're able to help do some business with some, some, some things. So do that in the, in the context of community. And then thirdly, I think your elders, part of our job is to help defend. So it's, it's, not, it's not a strange practice to send your elders a, an email that says, hey, here's a list of books I've recently read. Here's some ones that are on my reading list. And here's the podcast that I'm listening to. Any, any thoughts or any other recommendations or any, any concerns? Like, that's a fine, normal thing to do. So I encourage you to, to utilize that. Yeah. Look, Patrick, again, looking at chapter 4, verse 18, uh, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Yeah. Paul clearly has a different definition of safety. Yeah. Because being brought safely into God's heavenly kingdom meant execution for him. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's it's, it's a great observation. And I think that's where our definition of safety should be shaped by, by this. What is safest is to be with the Lord. Peter knew that's why he hopped out of the boat in the midst of a storm. Like, I would be with the Lord. Um, it's, it's safer to be with Him. Um, and true safety is Him holding you fast until the end. It's great.